Physics hardly even acknowledges that the universe is random at its base. <laughs> we like to think we live in a deterministic universe and everything's deterministic, but I think that's probably, uh, you know, an artifact of the way that we've written down laws of physics since Newton invented modern physics uh, and his conception of motion and gravity, which, you know, he he formulated laws that had initial conditions and um, fixed dynamical laws. And that's been sort of become the standard canon of how people think the universe works and how we need to describe any physical system is with an initial condition and a law of motion. And I think that's not actually the way the universe really works. I think it's a good approximation for the kind of systems that physicists have studied so far. And I think it will radically fail um, in the long term at describing reality at its more basal levels. But not, I'm not saying there's a base. I don't think that reality has a ground. And I don't think there's a theory of everything. But I think there are better theories. And I think there are more explanatory theories. And I think we can get to something that explains much more than the current laws of physics do. When you say theory of everything, you mean like everything, everything? Yeah. You know, like in, in physics right now, it's really popular to talk about theories of everything. So string theory is supposed to be a theory of everything because it unifies quantum mechanics and gravity. Um, and... You know, people have their different pet theories of everything. And and the challenge with a theory of everything, I really love this quote, quote from David Krakauer, which is a theory of everything is a theory of everything except those things that theorize. Oh, you mean removing the observer from the thing? Yeah. But it's also it's also weird because if a theory of everything explained everything, it should also explain the theory. So the theory has to be recursive. And none of our theories of physics are recursive, so it's just a it's a it's a weird concept. Yeah, but it's very difficult to integrate the observer into a theory. I don't think so. I think you can build a theory acknowledging that you're an observer inside the universe. But it, doesn't it become recursive in that way? And that's you're you, saying it's possible to make a theory that's okay with that. I think so. I mean, I don't think you, there's always going to be. Um, the paradox of another meta level you could build on the, the meta level, right? So like if you assume this is your universe and you're the observer outside of it, you have some meta description of that universe, but then you need a meta description of you describing that universe, right? So, uh, you know, this is one of the biggest challenges that we face um, being observers inside our universe and also, you know, why the paradoxes and the foundations of mathematics and any place that we try to have observers in the system or a system describing itself uh, show up. Um, but I think it is possible to build a physics that builds in those things intrinsically without having them be paradoxical or have holes in the descriptions. Um, and so one one place I think about this quite a lot, which I think can give you sort of a more concrete example, is, is the nature of like what we call fundamental. So uh, we typically define fundamental right now in terms of the smallest indivisible units of matter. So again, you have to have a definition of what you think material is and matter is. But right now, the you know what's fundamental are elementary particles, um, and we think they're fundamental because we can't break them apart further. And obviously, we have theories like string theory that, if they're right, would replace the current description of what's the most fundamental thing in our universe by replacing it with something smaller. Um, but we can't get to those theories because we're technologically limited, and so. If you if you look at this from a historical perspective and you think about explanations changing as physical systems like us learn more about the reality in which they live, we once considered atoms to be the most fundamental thing. Um, and, you know, it literally comes from the word indivisible. And then we realized atoms had substructure because we built better technology, which allowed us to, quote, unquote, see the world better and resolve smaller features of it. And then we built even better technology, which allowed us to see even smaller structure and get down to the standard model particles. And we think that there might be structure below that, but we can't get there yet with our technology. So what's fundamental, the way we talk about it in um, current physics, is not actually fundamental. It's the boundaries of what we can observe in our universe, what we can see with our technology. And so if you want to build a theory that's about us, and about what, what's inside the universe that we can observe, not what's at the boundary of it, um, you need to talk about 
objects that are in the universe that you can actually break apart to smaller things. So I think the things that are fundamental are actually the constructed objects. They're the ones that really exist and you really understand their properties because you know how the universe constructed them because you can actually take them apart. You can understand the intrinsic laws that built them. But the things at the boundary are just at the boundary. They're evolving with us and we'll learn more about that structure as we go along. But really, if we want to talk about what's fundamental inside our universe, we have to talk about all these things that are traditionally considered emergent, but really just structures in time that have causal histories that constructed them and, um, you know, are really actually what our universe is about. So we should focus on the construction methodology as the fundamental thing. But do you think there's a bottom to the, the smallest possible thing that makes up the universe? I don't see one. And you, it'll take way too long. It'll take longer to find that than it will to understand the mechanism that created life. I think so, yeah. I, th I think for me, the frontier in modern physics, where the new physics lies, is not in high energy particle physics. It's not in quantum gravity. It's not in any of these sort of traditionally sold, this is going to be the newest, deepest insight we have into the nature of reality. It is going to be in studying the problems of life and intelligence and the things that are sort of also our current existential crises as a civilization or a culture that's going through uh, you know, an existential trauma of inventing technologies that we don't understand right now. <laughs> the existential <laughs> trauma and the terror we feel that that technology might somehow destroy us, us meaning living, intelligent living organisms. Right. And yet we don't understand what that even means. Well, right. humans have always been afraid of our technologies though, right? So it's kind of a fascinating thing that every time we invent something we don't understand, it takes us a little while to catch up with it. I think also in part humans kind of love being afraid. Yeah, we love being traumatized. It's weird. The we want to learn more. And then when we learn more, it traumatizes us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never thought about it this before, but I think this is one of the reasons I love what I do is because it traumatizes me all the time. <laughs> that sounds really bad. But what I mean is like, I love the shock of like realizing that like coming to understand something in a way that you never understood it before. Uh, I think I, I, it seems to me when when I see a lot of the ways other people react to new ideas that they don't feel that way intrinsically. But for me, that's like, that's why I do what I do. I, I love, I love that feeling. But you're also working on a topic where it's fundamentally ego destroying because <laughs> you're talking about like life. I mean, it's humbling to think that we're not, the individual human is not special. Yeah. And you're like very viscerally exploring that. Yeah. I'm trying to embody that. Uh, because you, I think you have to live the physics to understand it. But uh, there's a great quote of, about Einstein. I don't know if this is true or not, that he once said that he could feel a light beam in his belly. Uh, and I think, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but I think like, you got to think about it though, right? Like you're, if you're a really deep thinker and you're really thinking about reality that deeply and you are part of the reality that you're trying to describe, like you feel it, you really feel it. That's what I was saying about, <laughs> you're always like walking along the cliff. If you fall off, you're falling into madness. Yes, it's a constant, constant descent into madness. The fascinating thing about physicists and madness is that you don't know if you've uh, fallen off the cliff. Yeah, you know, you don't know. That's, that's the know. cool thing. About I rely madness. on other people to tell me. Actually, this is very funny because I, like, I have these conversations with my students often. Like, they're worried about going crazy. <laughs> I have to like <laughs> reassure them that like one of the reasons they'll stay sane is by trying to work on concrete problems. <laughs> Going crazy or waking up? I don't know which one. <laughs> which one it is? Yeah.